Hello, good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Dr. Katherine Miner. I am one of the World Language Program Consultants here at CLET World Languages, and it is my absolute pleasure to have all of you here with us this evening for this webinar with Rebecca Blue Wolf. Also, my absolute pleasure to um, introduce her. I've had the pleasure of meeting Rebecca a couple of times um, at her session at NECTFL this past year and at ACTFL and working with her to prepare this webinar, and we are so very excited to have her here with us. So Rebecca is a French teacher and Fulbright teaching scholar, certified modified oral proficiency tester, and national board certified teacher. She has received various educator awards, including recognition as the 2019 MAFLA and NECTFL Teacher of the Year and the 2020 ACTFL Teacher of the Year. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Rebecca uh, to start this webinar. But before I do, um, I did just want to go over a couple of ground rules that we have for the webinar. Um, and so first of all, we're starting the session right now, right on time at 6 p.m. Eastern time. The session is being recorded, so you can watch the video in a week. The recording and PowerPoint will be sent to you. The length of the session is 60 minutes and we'll have up to 30 minutes for Q&A at the end. We ask that you please ask your questions using the Q&A feature. So if you'll look uh, along the bottom of your, your Zoom screen, you'll see the chat you're very familiar with and then also another box labeled Q&A. Please ask your questions here. Please use the chat feature sparingly so as not to disrupt the session, although Rebecca will be inviting you to use the chat at a couple of different instances. And then, of course, you're you know, more than welcome to, uh, to put the responses that she's eliciting right there in the chat. Due to time constraints, participants will not be able to turn on speaking, and we will answer as many questions as time allows. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Rebecca Blue Wolf. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Catherine, and hello, people whom I cannot see, but I'm so glad that you're choosing to spend some of your valuable, precious teacher time with me this evening, and I'm going to do my absolute best to make sure it is worth your while, and um, I'll just say that probably like many of you, I'm a full-time classroom teacher, and so what I'm going to be sharing this evening is very much based on my desire to find practical, reasonable, doable techniques for working with my students. And the context where I teach, I teach in a suburban school system where world language is offered at the elementary for Spanish only. And then when the kids get to middle school in sixth grade, they have a choice of five languages, uh, Chinese, Latin, German, Spanish, or French. So I get students in sixth grade every other day of our cycle for about 45 minutes. And they've had several years of elementary Spanish, which is an incredible background for them to bring to the program. And then I pass them off to my colleagues for seventh grade. And then in eighth grade, I get pretty much those same students back um, for the eighth grade program, which meets every day. And the proficiency targets that we use in the course, for those of you who are familiar and for whom this would be a useful reference, we have a novice mid target for the sixth graders and a intermediate low target for the eighth graders. So I have been teaching all day. Things are a little crazy already at my school in December. It's the opening night of the school play. So I apologize if my voice is a little scratchy. I just had a cup of tea, which will hopefully make it more bearable. And what we're going to be talking about tonight is this idea of tasks with a very particular definition of task, which I will get into with you shortly. And the way that looking at our teaching through this lens of tasks can really provide communicative purpose, which is so, so important to everything we do and certainly important to our learners, right? Kids are taking our class for the most part because they want to be able to speak with people in the language, people from the target cultures. And so what I love about tasks is it's not extra work. It's not another thing. It's like a small tweak to something that you're probably already doing that adds more value. And so I, I wanted to give it the subtitle that it kind of gives your lessons more bang for the buck, because I do think it's a way, you know, for me, for example, to take my 45 minutes and just get more out of that time without having to um, do more. And I think also tasks 
sort of answer our question of why, both from like the teacher why, in terms of, you know, I have my daily can do for my lesson. And so I have a reason why I want students to do something in my class. But I like tasks because they also give the learners a why. And I think when we when we use a task, it is clearer to our students what the purpose of doing this work in the classroom is, which can really increase engagement as students sort of feel that greater sense of purpose. Um, and it's it's just a lens, you know, to sort of look at your practice. So one of the things I want to invite you to do as we're as I'm talking you through the slides this evening is to really think about, you know, the lesson you taught today or the lesson you taught on Monday or the lesson you're going to teach tomorrow. And where does your teaching kind of show up in these examples? Are there things that feel familiar? And then are there tweaks that you might want to make? So I'm just going to show you what our plan for the evening is. I'm going to start by talking about what we mean by exercises. Um, and then from there, we'll talk about activities. And then we'll get to really like the centerpiece, which is tasks. And the idea will be to sort of think about, are there exercises in our existing instructional repertoire? And I'm going to make the case that exercises really don't deserve a place in our instructional repertoire. And so if you're able to spot them in your own teaching, then that might help you think about, hmm, is this really the best use of my time? Is this really something I want to be doing with my students? And then from there, could we, if, if we're, if we, if I succeed in convincing you that you do not want exercises in your lessons and we're left with activities and tasks, are there any existing activities that you're using in your teaching? that you could sort of taskify and like turn into a task by making a small shift and kind of applying that lens that we're going to be looking at together. And as Catherine mentioned, we'll be spending, I'll be spending like an hour sort of giving the presentation. Um, there'll be some opportunity for back and forth even then, and then time for lots of time for questions afterwards. So I think if we just consider, you know, we have limited time with our learners. And sometimes, you know, I'll think about a student I have who's struggling and I'll think, gosh, if this kid just could be immersed in the target language, I know they would learn the language, right? Like every child in France is speaking French. And so there's no reason that any of my students are not capable of doing that. Like I fully believe that almost all human brains can learn another language. And yet in the confines of our classroom, you know, we have this sort of very artificial structure and we only see them for so many minutes a day or, you know, a few times a week. That time's very, very precious. And so then we have to think about what's the very best time, the very best use of that time. And so everything I want to talk about tonight comes back to meaning and purpose. And when I talk about meaning, what I mean is, I mean, to what extent are students having the opportunity to interpret the meaning of a message? So how much exposure are they getting to the language where they have to make sense of it? And then also how many opportunities do they get to express themselves in the language? So, you know, one, one, something I learned about teaching very early on that was a very powerful visual for me was the idea of wagon wheel teaching. So if you can picture a wheel and the teacher's in the middle of the wheel and all the students are around the rim, if, if the teacher is the only person who interacts with each child in the language, so it goes teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher, student, you know, that's, we could call that wagon wheel teaching. And the kids, only one child can talk at once. So if I have a 45 minute class and I'm talking half the time as I interact, there's like only 22 minutes left for my students. And I frequently have at least 22 kids in the room. So then each child would only get to speak in French for one minute. So if I can create opportunities where the students are talking to one another, I can quickly increase that time exponentially, right? The kids can be talking to each other for as much of the class as I'm able to facilitate and kind of get them into the groove to do that. So that's going to give them so many more opportunities to express meaning. So we're going to come back to meaning again, but I just want to make clear there's like these two parts of meaning. There's interpreting the message and then there's expressing a message. In terms of purpose, you know, that really comes back to what I mentioned at the start about this question of why. And the teacher's going to hopefully have the lesson planned with a why in mind, that there is a meaningful communicative goal for the lesson. And that, that also needs to be something that speaks to our learners. And, and if we can get all of those pieces happening together, then we really should be set up for good engagement. 
and, and I saw that there's a lot of middle school teachers here. So I think we all know, even with the perfect lesson, you are still dealing with the reality of the moment and it might start raining or a certain team might win a world cup game, or it might be the day before the big play and things are going to be a little haywire. So, you know, we're teaching in reality, clearly. Um, I hope I'll make that clear throughout my remarks. So I want to start by just examining this difference between exercise, activity, and task. And I'm going to show you a simple table that we will come back to again and again and sort of talk you through each of the parts. Um, so up here, we've got this first column. What are we talking about? So we're lo really looking at three kinds of classroom practice, which for just the purposes of, of this webinar, and this is all based, this language is based on this fantastic book, which I will reference again later, called While We're on the Topic by Bill Van Patten. And this is his language. So we were talking about what he's gonna call exercises, activities, and tasks. And then again, I mentioned earlier, it's all about meaning. So as you will see shortly, an exercise happens in a language classroom, but does not require the learner to express meaning nor interpret meaning. Okay. And therefore it can have no communicative purpose, right? So that is like a not communicative activity. We're going to look at some examples. Um, it's not something we want to spend a lot of time on neither in this webinar nor in our classrooms. However, if we think about activities and I think in well-functioning language classrooms, this is sort of the main event of most of our lessons. There, there is opportunity for students to express and interpret meaning. So they are speaking the language, they are writing in the language, they are listening to people speak and they are showing that they understand that. They are reading texts and saying what they understand that. They are maybe looking at images, uh, watching movies, and then they're having a chance to show what they have understood from that message. Okay, so that's happening in the activity. And I hope we would all agree that is like critical to language learning. However, what the activity does not have if we come over here is that communicative purpose. So the kids might not have a sense of why this matters, uh, neither in like the big sense of like, how is this part of my language learning journey, but nor in the sense of like, is there any particular reason I need to do this? Is something going to happen afterwards where if I haven't done this, I'm going to regret it or miss out? And so Bill Van Patten's argument is that activities are partially communicative. They have this one piece, but not this other piece. Therefore, what is most interesting here is what he calls tasks. And when he writes about them, he uses a capital T. So we're kind of distinguishing this from like our normal word task, and we're saying capital T task. In a, in a task, just like in an activity, there are opportunities for students to express meaning. So they are speaking, they are writing, they are signing a message, and there is interpretation, okay? They are watching, they are listening, they are making meaning out of something in the target language. And separate and apart from the previous two, now we have a communicative purpose. The why is fully formed. This thing that they are doing, this task, leads to something else, it is part of something bigger and therefore it is fully communicative. Okay, so these are the pieces that we're gonna kind of pull apart. And I do wanna start by talking briefly about exercises, just because um, basically when I read this book, I, I was in this um, middle school professional learning community of local middle school French teachers and we would get together. And one of the teachers had bought this book and she was like, we have to read this chapter together. We have to talk about it. And as soon as I read the chapter, I just kind of felt like I was like looking at my teaching, like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing something that I've never seen before. And so I do think there's a purpose in knowing what an exercise is, if only for us to say, oh yeah, next time I come across that, I am not going to do that with my students because it's not purposeful. Okay. So again, exercises, there's nothing happening with expressing meaning. There's no message coming that the students have to interpret and therefore no communicative purpose. This is not about communication. And so, so, so much of what we teach, really everything falls under that rubric of communication. So um, worksheets, I have two middle schoolers who are a little bit sassy myself. Actually, I should say I have a middle schooler and now a ninth grader, a high schooler in my own home, my own kids. And sometimes they will come com home and complain that all they did was like packets and worksheets. And so generally speaking, um, there are a lot of those that are sort of missing the mark and come into the rubric of exercise. Not everything that is written on a sheet and put through a photocopier is 
a exercise. And this is a conversation we will have at our dinner table sometimes when my kids complain. However, these are some choice examples that I pulled out of the photocopier at my own middle school. And I just want to sort of talk about how they show what it is to be an exercise. So on the left, we have the word search and it's places around town. And then you'll see at the bottom, there are words for different places in French and they're already in French. And then you have to find them in the word search, right? But just notice, you don't need to know what those words mean, right? I can look at that word gar, train station, and maybe I've forgotten what it means. And I think it means war, guerre, or I have no idea what it means. And all I need to do is identify the letters G-A-R-E in order, and I have found that word. So I never had to interpret any meaning. Of course, I'm not expressing any meaning because I'm not communicating either. And so therefore, not communicative, really not worth your time. Now, if you have word searches on hand because it's a sponge activity or it's the day before vacation and the rest of the day is shot with concerts and parades, no guilt. Keep them in your back pocket when you need them, but do not think that this would ever help a child learn a language, okay? On the right, um, this one is set up like a Sudoku. So you have to fit in the clothing words so there are no repeats in each of the boxes, like Sudoku does it with numbers, here it's with words. But again, it's about clothing. The clothing items that are part of the puzzle are at the bottom. They are labeled in French. So anyone who can read this alphabet could do this activity. And you don't need to know anything about the language to do it. You just look in this you know, upper left-hand box. Okay, there's already une robe. So therefore, what can I put here that's not this or that? So maybe your logic skills would improve, but that's not going to help you communicate, right? You're not interpreting any message. You're certainly not expressing a message where the words goes in the go in the boxes is not telling anyone anything. Okay. So um, I did have a conversation with the teacher who had made these photocopies and I did get the right one out of her hands before it made it to students, which I felt good about. But this might be a conversation you want to have with some of your colleagues. Like, what are students, what are we actually asking students to do when we give them these exercises? And is that furthering our goals for our learners? So just some talking points if you happen to see one of these in a photocopy, photocopier near you or in a folder of your old materials as you come across it when you get to your next unit. So again, I think our question really is, how can we eliminate exercises from our teaching repertoire? Because they don't allow learners to interpret meaning, they don't express meaning, the learners aren't expressing meaning through these, and therefore they have no communicative purpose, okay? So um, I'm gonna, at this point, put exercises aside and invite you to do the same in your teaching practice. And therefore, I want to move on to something a lot more interesting, which is activities. And just to come back to our friendly grid here, if we go along this second row, the activity does incorporate some expression and or interpretation of meaning. So the kids are working with a message in the language and trying to make sense of it and or they're trying to give a message, okay? But there's not a clear communicative purpose. And you're gonna see, this is not like totally cut and dry. It's a little bit up to interpretation, but it you'll see when you see task, there is a distinction. And therefore this one is really only partially communicative. I think um, some of these will probably look very familiar. And many of these, just to be perfectly honest, come from my own practice. And I am still very much on a journey of trying to taskify more of my instruction when I come across things that are still sort of at the activity level. I do feel pretty confident I've done away with the exercises. So that's a win. So for example, um, this would be kind of like a typical do now from my classroom in before times, before I had read this work, find out what your partner did this weekend. Um, you're gonna have five minutes to talk to your partner and then you need to be ready to report back to the class. Okay, so if we think about that, you know, you have to express a message and then you have to interpret what you heard so that you can report back. Um, and since there is both interpreting and expressing a message, meaning is on the scene. Finally, right? We saw those exercises. Meaning wasn't even part of it. Now you actually need to know the language in order to do the thing. So that's a positive. However, like what's the language goal here? Um, what's the point of listening to my partner? Is it just so I don't get in trouble when you call on me to report back? And so I think we do want to be like, I try to think of when I'm planning an activity, I think the best activities I plan are when I think about how will Jimmy 
do this activity. And Jimmy's the kid who sits in the back, doesn't really care, not motivated super by grades, not motivated by like negative peer feedback if he doesn't know what's going on. How will I get Jimmy to be engaged in this activity? And for this one, Jimmy might just sign out to the bathroom when it's time to report back and kind of avoid, right? So I haven't made it fully communicative. I haven't completely closed the loop on finding purpose, but at least there's some meaning, right? Like we're using the language to communicate ideas and there's a share back. So there is a small reason to listen for some learners. A different activity, one that I rather like, would be to have invite students to play like a very simple version of taboo. So a game of circumlocution, where you're trying to get your partner to guess something in the language by giving them a description. So this one comes from a unit on the town, life in the city, and we focus a lot on Quebec City in this unit because my students and I travel there. And so the students are familiar with a certain number of places and events and attractions. And at that point, they try to describe one to their partner very simply and see if the partner can guess what it is. And um, we often start by doing this where I let them say as much as they want to get their point across. And then we come to a place where we're ready to play one word taboo, which is great because like my students don't have a lot of words in French. So maybe they could just say hotel and very quickly, the other student will know, oh, right. What's that hotel that's in Quebec city? Oh, it's tricky because it's not called hotel. It's called Chateau. Oh, it's Le Chateau Frontenac. So it's a way for them to both express meaning. They have to listen to the clue. They have to see if they can solve it. Um, and I you know, will let them do this for a couple of minutes. Sometimes I'll provide some sentence starters, um, but there is expression and interpretation of meaning. And circumlocution is really a, a wonderful skill that we can allow our students to practice and learn in language class because it's gonna help them every time they get to a moment where they don't have the word in the language. And that is such a key skill for them as they develop their linguistic repertoire. Here's another way to play taboo if you wanna give kids maybe a little bit more time to prepare their clues, or if it's something that you wanna have them prepare in advance for homework and then play live in class. And so I often use Padlet for this, where I will provide some models. And I think this is really key when you're playing this early on. So I might say, um, I might write a sample taboo clue. This one says, it's the description of the boy that Ilona prefers and he is not skinny. So this is referring to a pop song that my students and I had been listening to and we'd watched the music video and we were trying to interpret the message. And now we're trying to come back to some of the key terms and ideas from that song by playing this game. So I'm trying to get the boys to think about, oh, right, there was the chubby boy. Uh, I'm trying to get the students to think about the chubby boy in the movie, in the music video, and can they come up with that word? So that might be a clue. Or what if I give them the clue, you know, it's a yellow form of transportation to go to school, um, but it's kind of a more elegant version than that yellow version. And then they might be thinking, oh, school bus, but in French, there's a different word for like a coach bus. So an autocar. So I might provide some samples. I might provide a word bank. Like, remember, these are the words that we're working on. These are the ones you could be writing clues for. And I might even give them some sentence starters. Okay. So it's a place where it's a thing that it's a type of transportation that, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and I did this example comes from COVID times when students were learning from home, I could let them loose and have them write, you know, a certain number of prompts or have them write clues over a certain amount of time. And there certainly would be expression of meaning. And then I would turn on that comments feature and I would allow students to guess one another's that I'd probably call time and say, okay, everyone go back to the clues you wrote and say whether or not the guesses were correct. And so there is that. Um, that moment where students have to really understand the language in order to communicate. But again, some students would definitely be asking, why are we doing this? What's the point? And it's not part of a larger project necessarily. I also wanted to give some examples from the world of CLET. As you know, they're the sponsors of this webinar. And just full disclosure, I'm, I'm being paid to give this webinar, so I just want to make that clear. Um, but they did give me a copy of their book, Reporter Francophone, and shared some examples of activities that appear in the book. So I just wanted to show you one example so you can kind of get a sense. And you might see this in other books that you are already using as part of your practice. Just to say, you don't have to invent every activity yourself. There's a lot of good stuff out there. 
So this one is sort of thinking about how can we develop ourselves at school? What if we were to imagine what our ideal class schedule would be? And then they have to think about, you know, the days of the week and the times, the kids already know the names for course subjects, and then they can decide like, when would I want my school day to start? Which classes would I take? How often would I take those classes, et cetera? And this is actually, I do this activity with my students in sixth grade after we've studied a number of authentic schedules from the French speaking world. And there's kids who like, you know, they want to start at noon and they want to have gym for six hours a day or whatever. So, and that can be a fun then topic for conversation. So there's definitely opportunities here to express meaning. And then when you, uh, there's some steps here about comparing with pairs, and that would be an opportunity to spend some time interpreting other people's schedules and maybe thinking about um, what you think of other kids' schedules based on your own preferences and interests. So just wanted to share that example from the book. So just to think in general about what we've seen from activities, as compared to exercises, activities do allow learners to interpret meaning, okay? They also can allow learners to express meaning, but they lack that deeper communicative purpose. And so the kind of question or caveat, if we only have activities in our repertoire of instruction, is that learners may wonder, like, why are we even doing this? What's the point? And uh, as much as I love to believe that having a daily can-do posted on my board at the beginning of every lesson gives every student enough motivation to stick with me for the whole lesson every day, I do think it's even better if we can bake it in. So at this point, I want to bring us over to tasks and just look at um, how tasks differ from what we've seen in exercises and activities. So like activities, tasks involve the expression and interpretation of meaning. So often when I show you these examples of tasks, you're going to see that it's kind of activity plus. So if you know how to make an activity, you are already well on your way to being able to create a task. The tweak, and again, what I love is it doesn't make it bigger or more complicated. It's just a tweak is how do we add in that communicative purpose in such a way that we're creating something that is fully communicative. And I mentioned early, earlier, this is not totally cut and dry, black and white. There are different opinions about what it means to have communicative purpose. So I just want to come clean on that one and give you a little bit of a sense of what some of the research says on this topic. And what I'm going to be referencing here are some really valuable resources from Florencia Henshaw. Um, she's a wonderful author, uh, language instructor. She shares a lot on Twitter and other social media. And she has a YouTube channel called Unpacking Terms and Unpacking Language Pedagogy, where she kind of goes through a lot of research and boils it down to the truly salient points, which I love because I'm not a big research reader myself. So for example, when she talks about the difference between tasks and language practice, and language practice would be exercises and activities in this context, um, Bill Van Patten sort of says in terms of context, our students are students. And so if we're asking our students like pretend that you're traveling abroad. Imagine that someone is visiting you from Ecuador. Um, uh, what if you were to create a club for a French speaking school and he really feels like anytime we're pretending, we're ignoring the context of the classroom. And therefore it's not authentic and it's really language practice and it's not true communication. So I will let each one of you kind of meditate on that and whether or not you agree with Bill Van Patten, but he's really saying the only authentic context is the class classroom. And we shouldn't apologize that kids are in classroom. Rather, we should create activities where the context where they're doing them that's meaningful is something for the classroom. Okay. But other people have other opinions. So if you look in this lower right-hand corner, Lisa and White, whose research Florencia summarizes very, very nicely, you know, say, okay, so planning an imaginary trip, no, that's, that's not real enough. That's not enough reason to do the communication. So that's not purposeful enough. But what if you had to interview your partner about a number of different things? And then after having interviewed them, you had to say, or maybe you interview three people in your class rather. And then you had to say, hmm, which of these three people would be the best travel companion for me? 
well, I'm vegetarian and I interviewed Catherine and I found out she only eats meat. So like, I don't know if that's really going to work for us, right? Maybe she's not my best travel companion. Maybe I should talk to Jimmy. Jimmy said he likes to go to bed early and get up early. Oh my gosh, that's like totally my schedule. Maybe he would be a better travel companion. Okay. So there's like one more step beyond the interview your classmates about where you actually reflect on what you've learned. And then you think about, hmm, if I were to take a trip, which of these people would suit me more? Okay. Now, not everyone's going to say that's an authentic enough context, right? Bill Van Patten would say travel companion. That's not happening in the classroom. Forget it. Um, Honestly, for me, I kind of feel like that's good enough, you know, for my students, if I can even just get back past planning an imaginary trip, that's, that's good progress from where I'm coming from. So just something to think about when you get the slideshow, there'll be all these links and you can certainly follow up, watch Florencia's videos, think what you, you know, decide for yourself. Um, and again, she has a whole video where she talks about the idea of tasks and gives different research perspectives on tasks. So that might be something else that you want to check out later. But again, if you look at the primary criteria that she's focusing on, meaning, right? So that's all about expression and interpretation of a message, that there's a gap. And I do think that the idea of having some sort of information gap is a good way for us to judge whether or not we're on target with what we're proposing. So like, is there a reason for me to ask you, right? If I ask you, what color is your shirt? Okay, so maybe on this webinar, that would make sense because I can't see any of you. So I don't know what color your shirts are, but why do I care what color your shirt is, right? So then I could do like a complicated dance, like, oh, imagine we're going to meet at a cafe and I won't be able to recognize you. So tell me what you're wearing so that I can recognize you. So I could do like a backward somersault to kind of make it try to come all together. Or I could think of something that is um, that I genuinely don't know and need to know. Um, and then maybe like my job is to design a great outfit for you. And you're going to tell me the kinds of things you like to wear. Cause I don't know what you like to wear. I generally need to find out from that, that from you in order to be able to create the outfit. So just thinking about, is there a gap? Is there actually something the child doesn't know that they need to find out in order to complete the task? Concrete outcome. And I know there's some elementary and middle school teachers on this uh, webinar. And so I think this will speak to you, but like really thinking about how do I know I am done and a task when well-written, you will know when you are done. Have you interviewed three people about the 10 criteria that we established? Have you decided which one would be your ideal travel companion? Well, then my friend, you are done. Okay. And so I do think we want to think about that. There's like a point where the mission is complete and we want to write that into our task as we draft it. Okay. And also thinking about, you know, students are going to be, of course, using available linguistic resources. There may also be non-linguistic resources that can support their work and, you know, images, music, um, different cultural pieces that might be brought in. So when you have some free time, I'm pretty sure this video, if you're interested in this topic, you're going to want to watch this video. So that's a little teaser for you. All right, so what I want to do now is get into the super practical, some examples of tasks, and um, we're going to go by size using the little doggies to help us, and we're going to start with smaller tasks as soon as I've had just one sip of tea. Okay, so when I first found out what tasks were, I was sort of intimidated and thought they had to be like these mega projects. So one thing that I learned from reading the Bill Van Patten book and that's been helpful to me is that actually tasks can be just as tiny as, as what you would be doing in class anyways. It's not some big thing. So let's look at a couple examples. Um, here's one. I introduced my students to the calendar and a French calendar is set up in a way that um, students from the United States are not necessarily familiar with. There are different days grayed out for holidays. The days of the week start with different letters. And so that can be a little disorienting for them. And the day of the first day of the week, if they look at a calendar that's set up week by week might surprise them also in terms of what's the first day of the week on a French calendar. Anyways, so they can get some interesting cultural information just by studying a calendar and kind of interpreting its message. And of course, we want to teach students how to ask, what's your birthday? And say their birthday. 
But then we want to think about like, what's the communicative purpose? Why should we bother doing that? So this comes straight out of the Bill Van Patten playbook. And the idea is just to make a class birthday calendar. And this is actually very sweet because I'm seeing names here of my sixth graders two years ago who are now my students in eighth grade. And so then the students could work together, interview everybody about their birthdays, get them all recorded. And then the point would be that we make sure to wish everyone a happy birthday when it's their special day. And actually we have someone on this webinar, Jimmy, whose birthday it is today. So if you wanna wish him happy birthday at some point in the chat, I invite you to do that. So that's just a tiny little task, but it meets the criteria, okay? It meets the criteria. Um, here's another tiny little task. So this is just like the do now as students are walking into my classroom as we're at the beginning of a unit about vacations. And students don't have a lot of language yet. So the message that they're interpreting here is in the language of emojis, okay? All they're using to communicate is letters of the alphabet. So they're going to look at these pictures and think about which of these things really speak to you for a vacation. And if it were me, I would be all about B, E, F, and G, okay? So I would say that to my partner. I like B, E, F, G. And maybe I know a couple of those words. I like the beach. I like to swim. And that's all I know how to say. That's fine. As long as I'm, you know, sticking to French. My partner is listening carefully. Why do they have to listen carefully? Because after they share out what they like in a vacation, we're going to rate ourselves on how different or similar we are. And I try to be consistent that one means we're very different. Five means we're very similar. And then students know I'm going to call on them and say like, how similar were, who was your partner? How did you rate yourselves? Oh, why did you rate yourselves them that, that way? And then that's an opportunity for them to say like, we both like B, or maybe they both know how to say we both like the beach or, um, you know, I like skiing, but he likes swimming, et cetera. So it ends up being a, a activity of interpreting meeting, expressing meeting, and then there's a communicative purpose to it. Now, again, Bill Van Patten would not like that we're thinking about a vacation because that happens outside of the classroom. I personally think in February in Boston, it's very nice to think about vacations and warm spots. So I will leave that up for you for debate. But again, it's quick and you know when you're done, right? That's another aspect of a task. It has a clear, finite end. Um, here is another one. I first learned about this from Lisa Shepard, who's an absolutely fabulous uh, retired French teacher. And it's explained very nicely on Florencia's YouTube channel because it is not necessarily the most intuitive activity. But basically, if you can picture crossword puzzles where all the vertical clues are empty on mine and all the horizontal clues are empty on yours, but the other part is filled out. And then we basically play a game of taboo, trying to give each other circumlocuted definitions of the words until each of us has a complete puzzle. So the students have to express meaning, they have to interpret meaning, they have to complete the puzzle, and it has a finite end. That is a very nice task. Another one, and this is like, I think from like the old, old classics of world language teaching, but it's still good, is to think about finding a time to meet with a partner. What's your schedule like? What's, you know, let me tell you about my schedule. Okay, when are we both free? Okay, these are the only two times we could meet. And kids, kids in my school are very busy. So I think this would actually take them some time to figure out. They would get to use lots of language about days of the week, times of the day, asking and answering questions. And there are times where my students will legitimately need to do this in my course. For example, in the spring, we do a cooking project and they need to get together outside of school to do the cooking. This could be something they could potentially do in the target language by spring if they've had some practice with this. So again, there's an info gap, right? I legitimately don't know when you're free. And that gives me a purpose for speaking to you. That's what makes it tasky and not just an activity. All right, here's another one from Klet. And here it's kind of like a mini project. And so we might think about what if you've joined a local French club and you're going to make a poster to introduce yourself to others, okay? So they're kind of creating this artificial context that gives a reason for why would we be doing this in French. And then you would think about, okay, what are the things you, what are your preferences? Can you document those with pictures and words? Can you present it to your peers? 
listen to others' presentations and think about what you have in common. And I think for that step five, finding the common points. For my middle school students, it would be very important to scaffold that. Like they would need a graphic organizer, note taker, while kids are presenting, you know, list this person's name. What's one thing you heard that you have in common? What's one thing you heard that was different? And I'll just make like a little soapbox about presentations. I used to have students get up and present in front of the whole class. And some of them were very, very nervous. And the others were often very, very bored. And it was a lot of work for me to focus on the kid who was presenting while I tried to keep all the bored children quiet while the poor nervous child presented. So my fix for this has been to try to do three or four simultaneous groups of kids presenting to peers. So I move the desks that day. I separate them into groups as far apart as I can get them. I assign them to groups. And if I'm in a group of four or five kids, I sit through and listen to three or four presentations. And I give my presentation in that much smaller setting. And then I run around with a clipboard that's pre-set up with all the kids' names and what I'm listening for. And I just try to catch snippets of the presentations. So at the novice level, you know, the presentational speaking mode is really not so important. It's not the focus. Novice speakers, generally speaking, do not give presentations in the target language because it's just too painful for everyone. But if we want to start getting them on that path, I think that's a way to do it where it's manageable for like the attention span of a middle school learner. Okay. Um, so anyway, so just something from Klet to think about as you look for more tasks to incorporate into your practice. Okay. So those were all pretty small tasks. Now we're going to move up to our next sweet doggy and talk about tasks that are a little bigger. So these are our medium-sized tasks. Um, and this is one that involves some images and if any of you are children of the 70s and 80s, like I am, you might remember Highlights Magazine, which I would read at the dentist, and it would have the two images and you had to find the differences. And this is the same kind of idea, working with pictures. And so you, you might, by some miracle, find two pictures that have exactly the words your students know how to describe, and you're able to just hand them out and let them do it. But in all likelihood, that's not going to happen, and you're going to have to do a little more work to think about how can we create a legitimate information gap such that students need to ask each other about their pictures. Um, and Florencia has some wonderful ideas about how to make that work. I'm gonna show you one way that I've done it with student created images. But I do think again, if we think about like, why is this a task? You know, if your partner and you are looking at different images, there's a built-in information gap, you have to communicate so that your partner can hear or read um, what's going on in the other image. And then you're listening to their message right? So that you've got that two-way communication meaning piece going. And then the purpose here, it says to spot at least five differences. So you know when you're done, the task is finite, and the purpose is just to find those differences. Now, that purpose is kind of small in the perspective of, you know, solving all the world's problems. Um, but I think for language class, there's a lot of rich language that students could use to do this activity. If we kind of bring it back to my classroom and just a way that I've handled this. It's again with Padlet. It's again with emojis. I think emojis are really, really great in the novice language classroom. We might have students post some emojis describing visually their ideal vacation. Okay. And then I might use these by printing them out, for example, to have some individual cards that show different students' preferences. And then I might hand those out. So I might hand out Sydney and Maria's to you and your partner. And then the two of you, without showing each other images, have to talk about what do they have in common? What is different? And that's going to involve a lot of sharing language until you come up with the differences. Now, with this one, you're not going to be able to tell kids exactly how many differences they're going to be able to spot because that's too much work for you to figure that out in advance. But I think you could say, you know, like talk to each other. I'm going to give you two minutes. How many differences can you come up with? How many things are similar? Do you, maybe, do you think these two students would be compatible travel companions? Why or why not? 
Okay. Uh, another one would be to have students doing some sort of written graphic organizer that summarizes the information that they've learned from the visuals. So if you're describing to each other what the vacations look like, then one way to sort of add on to that would be to have students to actually document it. So on the left, I'm just showing you the visual outline of what's called a double bubble mind map. And this is like another take on the Venn diagram. One of my beefs with the Venn diagram is that with the overlapping circles, there's like never enough in that little common area to put all the things that are similar. And so what I love about the double bubble is you can do it, you know, some, some, if you're in a one-to-one -one school, your school might have an app that allows students like something like inspiration or poplet to just set up a mind map this way. If not, they can just do it on paper, old school, which is beautiful. You get the names of the two kids, everything those two kids have in common, you write in the middle and then you circle it after you've written. So you never are trying to cram anything into a circle. You write what you have to write, and then you put the circle around it. And then the things that are different, those go off to the sides. Only the things about Maria, only the things about Sydney. And from a language teacher perspective, what's nice about the double bubble is that there's opportunities to do some third person plural, right? They like this, they don't like this, they prefer to travel this way, and some third person singular. So they also get a greater language exposure to like more structures than might otherwise come up naturally in class. So that's one potential structure, a setup for a graphic organizer. The other one on the right, I learned about also from Lisa Shepard, whom I mentioned earlier, and she calls it the top hat graphic organizer because it kind of has that top hat shape, shape. So at the top, you'd be listing differences side by side, things that are that Sydney, you know, Sydney likes to travel by bike. Maria really wants to go to Brazil. And then at the bottom, you've got that wider part. What do the two of them have in common? They both love the beach. Uh, they both like water, that kind of thing. And so I would just encourage you, if you're not using graphic organizers much in your classroom, so many of my students have IEPs that require graphic organizers as a preparatory, preparatory step towards further writing, that just giving this to everyone can be a great equalizer, a great support for kids who have low working memory, having that written reference in front of them as they complete a subsequent speaking task can really reduce anxiety and make sure that they have some of the language they need in order to be able to communicate. Um, so that's just an invitation to think about graphic organizers as a support for task work. As I mentioned earlier, that rating idea is a really easy final step to add to something that would otherwise be an activity that just really reinforces for the student, why should I listen to my partner? Oh, because I have to decide how similar or different I am from them or from the person they're presenting. And so that's like a quick fix. Uh, if you just want to pick up some quick tricks from our time together tonight, I would encourage you add a rating one to five next time you have something that's kind of activity-ish and see if that brings it up to what you would consider task-worthy. Okay, here's another one where if you're working on any sort of um, like social justice issue, um, something that's like more cultural, where there could be different opinions, this can be a really nice way to get students to spend more time interpreting meeting and then have a reason to express their meaning. So my students and I, I took the old unit on like the house from the textbook and made it into a unit on tiny houses. And one of the things that we do as part of this unit is we start to learn about like, why would people live in a tiny house and how are tiny houses valuable in today's world? And so I provide students with these little post-its that have statements on them that say things like, I help the homeless with my family or with my community. Uh, it's important to construct tiny houses for refugees. The problem of homelessness is important to me. So different opinion statements. 
And then I ask students to position these statements according to how much they agree or disagree with them. So this I set up on Jamboard, which is a great Google product that you can access if you have access to Google Suite. So on the left, I would put all the things that I'm firmly agreeing with. On the right, things that I don't agree with. That whole part of the board stays stationary and the students just move the boxes. So this is like a really an input activity. But then the kids come to a partner who's also prepared this and using that support, they talk to each other. What are the things that you really agree with? Oh, me too. Oh no, you didn't, you didn't, you totally disagree with that. Oh, we're kind of different on that one. And then again, there's this moment where they have to rate how similar or different they are. And then I might even go another step, which is post your rating on Padlet and tell me why, where were the areas that you agreed or disagreed with your partner? So it's a way for them to reuse with purpose some really key phrases that I want them to be familiar with from the unit in purposeful communication that leads to a final piece. And that's that's what makes it a task. Here is a, another one from our friends at CLET. And so here we're looking at a survey of what people do on the weekend and how many people like to do different kinds of activities. And then having completed that survey, which is the part that they explain at the top of the slide here, um, we might think about, you know, what have we learned about the class as a consequence, okay? And, and, and sort of recording that. Now, again, I think this one, as I look at it, I'm thinking maybe more activity than task because there's not a next step. Um, but we might think about from here, what is something we might do? For example, how likely are you to run into your partner on the weekend, given what you like to do, right? If your partner spends their whole weekend online, they're probably at home. I know you are unlikely to see them, but if your partner loves going out with friends and so do you, there's a good chance you might run into them. So again, you might take something that you find in a textbook and just bump it up a notch to give it that task component. Oh, here we go, sorry. All right, great. So then here they're turning it into an infographic and that does involve that next step where the students have to sort of summarize the information. I do think even with that summary, it's nice to have the kids think about some sort of a rating that makes them reflect on the whole process. That just takes it to the next level. Um, here's one that I use as an interpersonal speaking activity where students have been studying what people in different cultures eat for breakfast. And so they're gonna have a small group conversation uh, in French about what do you typically eat for breakfast? And the part that makes it a little more interesting and more spontaneous is you're going to be assigned a role, but you don't know which role you'll be assigned in advance. So maybe you're going to be a vegetarian, maybe you're going to be French, maybe you're going to be Canadian, and you're going to really need to speak from that role as you have your conversation. And you're going to be listening to what other people say about what they eat for breakfast so that you can give them some suggestions about what you've learned about eating a healthy breakfast. In this case, students had listened to a like a TikTok video from a nutritionist in Paris about what are the key components of a healthy breakfast so that they could sort of respond through that lens to what kids had to say about what they were eating. Okay, so I want in this last part, and then we will um, do a little learning check all together, is just to think about some bigger tasks and I do want to give the caveat that in order to do a big task, you're probably going to have to do some activities to get there. So, for example, I mentioned earlier that I study Quebec City with my students. What about having them create an ideal itinerary for a trip to Quebec? And then once they've created that itinerary, they share it in small group presentations, like I mentioned earlier, that are happening concurrently. And after they've presented, they get into other groups and they talk about what are the things that we as a group really want to see together? What are the things that are interesting to all of us? And maybe I assign you a profile and you have to sort of present your profile. Like my name is Rebecca. I love history and I only take public transportation. And you have to sort of mine your knowledge in order to come up with what are some attractions you would recommend to me 
what can I see that's historic and that I can get to by public transportation? And students have taken notes, they have a graphic organizer and they're kind of working from that. So that's like, could take two weeks from start to finish, um, but it is really rich. And it does end with a, a finite piece that resolves an information gap. Another one is in March when my students are getting really exhausted. I do a unit on teen well-being, looking at sleep, sleep and screen time. And they start with exploring a bunch of authentic resources. They do a gallery walk where they look at different infographics and they do this thinking routine called See, Think, Wonder, where they kind of study the resources. There might be some ed puzzles that I've put together. They read the texts and try to con connect them to themselves. They read a couple of different infographics and try to notice what are some of the commonalities. They're pulling out some common vocab that's important. And then from there, they could write a survey and survey both their class members and their ePals in France. And that involves, you know, you have to come up with the questions and write the survey. And then you have to look through the results and really understand how did kids here answer? How did the kids in France answer? And then from that, then they could study the ePals in France and their individual ePals answers would be viewable to them and maybe put together a little well being kit for them. Here's some tips based on what I've learned about screen and sleep time. These are some things that might help you because I noticed in your survey, you mentioned that you, you know, sleep with your phone in your bed or whatever it is. So again, that would be a multi-week task with a lot of parts to it. Um, and some of those would look like activities, but by the end, we would really have come to that task level. Okay. So at this point, I would like to get a sense of um, how you're doing on differentiating between exercise, activity, and task. So what we're going to do, initially, this had been conceived for a um, uh, situation where I could see you. But since I can't, we're going to use the numbers one, two, and three to say what we think these are. And the way it's going to work is that Catherine is going to put in the chat question one, and you're going to think about what your answer is. You can type the number one, two, or three into the chat, but you're not going to hit return until I say go. And then when I say go, everyone will hit return and we'll kind of flood the chat with their answers and we'll get a sense of whether or not we agree if something is an exercise, an activity, or a task. Mm -hmm. So for the first one, find out if or how your partner celebrates birthdays. Do you think that is an exercise, an activity, or a task? I'm just going to take 15 seconds for you to think about it. You can type the number in, but don't hit return yet, okay? Okay, so go. You can now hit return. Put in your number. What do we think? Okay, so I'm seeing mostly twos with a little variation, and I would tend to agree, right? You're going to have to express some meaning. You're going to have to interpret a meaning, some meaning from your partner, but you don't maybe know why. Why do you care how your partner celebrates birthdays? Are you planning a party for them, et cetera? Okay, great. So that's going to be the end of question one for this next one. And again, don't hit return until I tell you. You can be thinking, you can type the number, but don't hit return for number two. Check off activities you did this week and then compare with a partner to find out who was more active. Then look at average activities, activity levels by age and see where you fall. Like relative to other people who are in their late 40s, am I a relatively active or um, sedentary person? All right, so type your number in and I'll tell you when to hit return. Okay, go. What do we think? This is great. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm starting at the part, the start, but this looks like I'm seeing lots and lots of threes. Okay, I agree. This really does meet the standard of a task. Okay, number two, hold those return buttons. What if I give you a fill in the blank verb conjugation sheet? 
And it's going to be, we're going to focus on a regular present tense verb. So just don't press return yet. Just type the number in, hold on that return button. I'll let you know when it's time. Okay, go. Okay, beautiful. I see lots of ones. Perfect. We agree. That's an exercise. Okay. Um, and so, so we're not going to do that, right? Because that's not helping our students learn to communicate. Number four, what do you think about this one? Create a flyer in the target language for a local nonprofit to increase their visibility. I'll let you know when it's time to press return. Okay, go. This one's very interesting. It's like two, three, two, three, two, three, two, three. Okay. So I think, I think it kind of depends how you define communicative context. And are you convinced? Um, I mean, if it's, if it really is a local nonprofit and you're actually helping them become more visible by creating the flyer, to me, that feels like very authentic reason for communication. And it really would meet the standard of task. If it's you're being told to do that, but there's not actually a local nonprofit that uses that language, or you're never going to actually put up the posters, then I think it would be more of an activity. All right. Number five, from a list of sports, check off those you do now, used to do, or have never done. Interview a classmate and then discuss, are you more active today or when you were a child? All right. Put your number in. I'll let you know when to hit return. Okay, go. Great. So I'm seeing mostly threes and some twos. Yep. And I think the fact that there is that question about being more active today or when you were a child, that's the, that's intended to give that purpose. You might be more or less convinced that it's sufficient. Um, let's look at six. Make a class allergy chart ahead of your first class party. I'll let you know when it's time to type the number with the return, but you can put the number into the chat for now already. Okay, go. Okay, so I'm kind of interested that this is getting a lot of ones and twos. I don't know, all of my students are allergic to a million things. I could not plan a party if I didn't know who was allergic to what. So I would have to really ask them, what are some of the things you can't eat or you won't eat? And then they would need to let me know. And then we need to have a conversation. Can we serve this? Can we serve this? Why not? Uh, to me, that feels pretty purposeful and that there's a legitimate info gap. It would be small, but I still think it meets the task standard. All right, seven, match images from a story to excerpts from the text. And I'll let you know when to hit return. Okay, go. Okay, great. And I just realized I can actually reveal the answers that we've already come up with here so that we can see those. I apologize. I was not hitting them. Okay. Thank you for sharing that one. Let's look at our, okay. So images to excerpts from a text. I think you're definitely interpreting, but it's not really clear why. So that would bring us to an activity. How about for number eight, play a guess who game to find out which classmate the teacher is thinking of. All right. I'm going to let you type in your number. And go. Yep. So I would agree um, for this one. We're really, we're in the realm of activity. You're using the language, but why, why does it matter who I'm thinking of? What's the point? How about surveying classmates to see if they get an allowance and have a paid job? Any thoughts on that one? Okay, go. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that's pretty, pretty activity based, unless there's some reason you need to know what, what people are doing with that money or that lack of money, then that wouldn't work as a task. Last one, interviewing classmates to find the best time for a weekly lunchtime conversation group for students to increase their comfort with speaking. I'll give you five seconds to think about that one, then we'll hit return. Okay, for our last one, go. Yay, all right, and the crowd says task. Awesome, okay, so I wanna grant people, you have my uh, official invisible certificate of understanding the difference between activity, exercise, and task, bravo. And I think the questions to ask yourself are, do my students need to interpret or express meaning in order to do this? And then what's the point? And how will I know if I'm done? And if you hit both of those, you're in the land of task. So again, um, when you get the slideshow, you'll see these links, but Florencia Henshaw has some great videos. While we're on the topic is a great book. It's tiny, so just it's just this thin. It's not a big read. And um, at this point, I think we're gonna turn it over to questions. So thanks so much for your listening. And Catherine, um, I think I'll turn the slideshow off so we can see each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, great. absolutely. Okay, great. Rebecca, thank you so much for that really rich and really elucidating talk. I think that we all got some really practical uh, classroom tips and examples, and then some more sort of meta language we can be thinking about for uh, you know lesson planning um, in the future. So thank you so much. We do have a few questions that have already come in um, and some others that I'm sure will come in as we start discussing. Um, so the first question is, do you recommend using exercises as homework only or not at all? Not at all. I don't think you want to give students homework that's not helping them advance their communication skills. And there are, if, you, if you're committed to giving homework, and I, I do give homework, I will just say that, I think there are plenty of ways to do pieces of activities and tasks as part of that homework, and therefore making sure that students are working on language communication all the time. Great. Another question we have is, are role-playing dialogues considered activity or task? Um, and you kind of alluded to this, you know, you had a couple of examples there of assigning students a role. Um, you know, if you make students create a dialogue simulating a real life situation while they're also practicing different structures and vocabulary, would that fall under activity or task? Okay. So I think there's a distinction here between having students write a skit and perform it which would be a presentational task. And there's no communication happening during the performance because everyone's already decided in advance what they're gonna say. And they may or may not understand what they're gonna say. And if, uh, you know, if Catherine stops talking, I could just keep going with my part of the skit because I've memorized it. So I just wanna make it really clear that is not interpersonal communication. It is not spontaneous and there is no negotiation of meaning. I'm just saying what I memorized or what's on my page, whether or not it makes sense. So that's one kind of role playing, which I would, um, I mean, even, I'm not even sure where that would fall on this. I guess the writing of the skit would be an activity because you have to express meaning in the language, but there's, there's no back and forth. If students are having a spontaneous conversation, like oh, what do you like to eat for breakfast? And in the in that moment, you've just picked a card out of a hat that says you're a vegetarian. Then you have to do some thinking on the spot. Oh, for breakfast, I like to eat eggs and bread with jam. I don't eat bacon at breakfast because I'm a vegetarian and I'm having to do some thinking on my feet. If I knew in advance that was the topic and I was gonna speak about myself, I could potentially have just memorized that whole sentence. I actually am a vegetarian. And said it, but but if there's an element of the unknown, and of course there's like plenty of scaffolding and practicing that goes in. This is not like let's just see in the moment what everyone can do in French. Like there's a lot of buildup to this. I think there has to be some element that's unknown, so that students in the moment have to 
think on their feet, have to improvise and have to respond to others. They don't know who's going to ask them what question and they need to be ready for that. I think that's a, a much more realistic situation. I think it prepares. I had the experience of being an A plus French student in junior high and then going to France and sitting in the back seat of the car as the mom drove me from the airport. I did not understand a word she was saying. And it was, it was humiliating. Um, and I had really never practiced spontaneous conversation before. So I, I, that's kind of always the thing. It's like me in the back of the Bertrand's car driving towards Nantes that haunts me when I make my students do these things that involve true interpersonal speaking communication. Yeah, I think that's the case for a lot of us that have gone on to careers as language teachers, that very formative experience of, of realizing that we don't even know what we don't know until we have it in that in that context. But um, look at what it's allowed us to do for the learners that come after us. Um, so the next uh, question is a little bit more terre à terre, I guess we could say, kind of um, just in terms of resources and and um, different um, tools that you can use in the classroom. What if you do not have Padlet? Are there any other resources that even non-technological that we can use for some of these activities in class? Absolutely. I mean, I have to say, a lot of these examples come from the time that I was teaching hybrid. And so we were using a lot of technology. And now that we have the privilege of having all the children in front of us most of the time, I'm really doing a lot of this paper-based. So, you know, Padlet is like a fancy way of writing in columns. You could have you know, butcher paper in your classroom and you could be drawing columns and sending the children up with markers. And I think they would probably be delighted. Um, if you can get access to lots of post-it post notes, you could be using post-it notes. For that activity I showed with like the opinions about tiny houses, those could be cards that you print onto cardstock and cut apart and keep as sets and baggies. And then you hand them out every year and have kids. That's how I used to do it and arrange them on the table. And then these days I might have them take a picture of it and then they have like a record to discuss from. Um, but that's that was the, the analog version before there was Jamboard for sure. Yeah, so I don't think, I guess just in terms of my learners and how distractible they are, if I can do it without a screen, I would rather. Because I'm pretty sure when I tell them today, for example, in class, look at these padlets of all the outfits your classmates posted. Let's have a conversation talk to your partner about which outfit looks the most like this kind of style and why you think that. As I walked around, I could see the children changing what they had been watching to what they were supposed to be looking at. So, you know, there's there's some great things about paper. Absolutely. Um, just a quick reminder for anyone that's asking questions to please put them in the Q&A now and not in the chat. That's where our webinar team can grab them so that we can pass them along. Um, so this next one is actually one that either you or I could answer. Someone asked what clip book the examples are from that you use that came from uh, uh, from our materials in the webinar. So why don't you uh, answer? I'll that go one. ahead and answer. The expert. So, yeah, so this uh, is our forthcoming series for middle school and high school French, Reporter Francophone, and uh, we are really pleased that both volumes one and two are going to be available um, in uh, the spring of this year, spring and, and summer of this year. So if you're interested in learning more, go to our website, cletwo.com, shoot us an email, fill out a sample request form, fill out a contact form, and we'll follow up with you and get you more information. Um, so the next question from Larissa is, how can you ensure that your students speak in French and are not using English? That's, you know, always the struggle, especially when we're doing a lot of that, like you were mentioning, putting them in smaller groups, which is so effective for really them, allowing them to communicate on that peer to peer level and giving them more speaking time. But as we all know, sometimes that devolves into, you know, just a little, you know, chuchotement of them speaking in English. So Correct. Yes. So there's a bunch of different things I do in my classroom to get buy-in for using the target language. And I am really committed to 90% plus, which is sort of the actual standard for target language use in the classroom. So I have a two-sided laminated poster that hangs on my board that says on one side, nous parlons français, we're speaking French. And it says on the other side, we're speaking English. And I do not allow myself to speak English when the nous parlons français poster is up nor do I allow students to speak English unless they've asked permission from me. So I really, and it's a pain to like, have me ask the class, puis je parle en anglais s'il vous plaît, and then go over there and turn the poster and then do my thing in English and then make a big stink about now I'm putting it, nous parlons français, we're going back. So that kind of encourages me to do it as little as possible because I, I need that motivation as well. 
In my classes, I also use a system with clothespins where every child has a clothespin that has their name on it. I keep them in shoe boxes. When you come to my class, you get your pants, your shoe, your clothespin, you sit down, you keep it on your desk. If I hear you speaking English, I take it away. If you successfully keep it the pass the whole period, you get like a bonus point that I keep track of. And at the end of the term, I allow students to buy back part of their grade based on how frequently they've been able to stick to using the target language. I also do a fair amount of like reflection, metacognition, like journaling in English with my students where I ask them like, why do you think Madame makes such a big stink about you speaking French in class? Um, how much French do you think you're using in class when you speak to Madame, when you speak to your partner? Um, what are some things you could do so that you would use even more French in class? And then last week, sort of coming back from Thanksgiving break, I took the best answers to that last question and put them up on the board. Here are six really awesome ideas that you and your classmates came up with for speaking more French in class. I would like you to pick one and commit to trying it this week. And I'm actually going to have you like copy it down in your journal. And some of them were like, instead of asking, can I speak in English? I'm just going to try to speak in French until I get stuck. And then I'm going to ask her, how do I say X when I get stuck? Because maybe I won't get stuck. Or I'm going to just say it in French, even if I know it's wrong, because maybe she'll understand me anyways. So, or, you know, these things that we kind of want them to come to understand and just making them super explicit, I think is important. Um and I'm teaching in a system where the kids have not had that level of expectation necessarily in their previous courses. So I'm having to assert it. Um, I have a class right now with two boys who are very strong. And one of them was speaking constantly in English to his partner before. So I was like, oh, this other kid is like so good. I'm going to put this kid with this kid. And this kid is like impervious to the influence and he will make him speak French. And what do you know? Now they're whispering in English. So today, as they came in, I said, Christian Oliver. What would you think about if I, if the two of you speak French today for the entire class, I'm giving everyone in the class two points. I was like, are you comfortable with me? Like saying that to the whole class? Would you think you could do that? And they were like, yeah. I was like, okay, let's try it. And Christian spoke English 15 minutes in, and that was it for today. But on the way out, I said, do you want to try again tomorrow? And they said, yes. So, you know, it's a journey. It is not perfect. I am willing to be strict and take that pass away from a kid because I think it's a powerful visual prompt. There's lots of other ways to handle it, but I think the kids need to see something when they've broken because otherwise it just becomes this back and forth, back and forth. And, and it's not enough for just the teacher to be speaking in the target language. The kids have to be using it too. So that involves like a lot of planning. Also thinking about like, you can't do a different activity every day and expect that you to be able to run that in the target language. You need to have like five great interpretive activities and kind of rely on them. And maybe the first time you do it, there's some English. And the second time there's like 10 seconds. And then the third time and the rest of the year, it's just like, oh, this thing, right. She wants us to blah, blah, blah. So kind of keeping your repertoire small can improve your chances of success. Great, thanks. Those are some really great tips and really creative ways for uh, looking for that 90% um, uh, guideline that we all wanna be working towards. Um, next question um, from Anne-Laure is, um, you know, do you teach grammar? How, how do you teach grammar? How does that fit in with your, with your approach to your teaching? Okay, so that's like a whole nother webinar. Um, I mean, listen, you have to have grammar to communicate, right? Communication is not just learning a list of words and then spitting them out anytime you want in any order and hoping people understand. Grammar is hanging it together. So there definitely has to be grammar as part of all of our language instruction, no matter what your like method or technique is or philosophy. In my class, how does that show up? It shows up through a lot of discovery activities, like maybe right now we're working on um, adjectival order because kids are learning about clothing. They're starting to notice, wait, this is weird. This word goes after, but this word goes before. What's up with that? So I might collect a bunch of tweets that have that as part of them. I might do like a pace style lesson where the kids have to like study the tweets first for meaning then be like, did you notice anything about the adjectives? All of which I've put in bold for you. Oh, we think we've noticed something. Okay, talk to your partner. Can you come up with a rule? What do you think the rule is? We talk about that. And then there's some sort of piece at the end where they're actually trying to communicate using the rule. I more and more, I'm really understanding that so much of the grammar that was in the textbook that I taught from for over a decade was not appropriate for novice learners. I was trying to get them to use 
you know, three different ways to ask a question, past, present, and future tense. It was insane. And some kids could like, some miracle kids could like memorize it all and spit it all back. I think some of the people on this webinar were probably those miracle kids in their generation, right? And and for most kids, they could maybe memorize it. They could maybe spit it back once. They didn't really know what it was. You ask them two weeks later, it's totally gone. And so I think I'm much more accepting of some of the imperfections around that, just as I understand more about language acquisition and how late some of that stuff comes in language development and how much I was trying to shove it down their throats early. So I teach fewer grammatical concepts now than I used to, but I also really give the language to students in chunks. So like for the unit we're doing right now, which is called like mon look et mon argent de poche, my style and my spending money, I'm giving them phrases like, I prefer to buy, I like to wear, um, they're wearing. In France, kids wear. And so I'm not saying to them, this is the verb to wear. It has six forms. I need you to memorize it in this configuration. They're getting the chunks and then they're using those chunks. At a certain point, I have verb conjugation charts hanging in my classroom. At a certain point, probably like March, a couple of kids are going to come up to me and be like, that chart is amazing. I'm looking at that all the time and it's helping. And I'm like, uh-huh, because you have a box in your brain where that makes sense to you now. But for the 10 kids who still don't understand the plural subject pronouns, it's just like, wah, 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 wah. and we can't really make them understand that when we want them to understand that. It has to kind of sink in. So they need to have that partial, partial understanding of the linguistic system, lots of exposure through input, some structured practice, and then you still have to accept they're going to mess up a lot. And that's normal. And it doesn't mean you're a bad teacher or that they're lazy kids. Uh, but yeah, grammar is like a huge topic. There's so much to it. I teach with Mike Travers, who's at Wellesley High School, who does some fantastic presentations um, for MAFLA, our state association for NECTFL, which is the Northeast. He speaks at ACTFL on grammar. You might look him up and, and see if there's some, like he does blog posts. You could you know see about that. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Moving towards, you know, what you're describing, that kind of proficiency, you know, giving students just the, the structures that they need at the time that they need them rather than feeling like we have to, you know, cram it all in because that's the way we, that's the way we've always taught or always learned the, the language. So um, that's a much better yeah. succinct summary. Thank you. <laughs> here's a, here's a, an interesting one. Um, students seem to like exercises. Do you think it's because that's what they're used to? So I think this really depends on the learner and sort of how they understand themselves and what their job at school is and probably what the rest of their curriculum looks like outside of the world language department. My students would not stand for exercises. They would see that as busy work, uh, boring, easy to copy from another child and just hand it in, get it done. Uh, I don't think many kids, any kids are signing up for the class saying my dream is to be able to, you know, conjugate all six irregular French verbs, you know, in the, in the first year of class. That's like, that's why I'm here. They, they really want to be able to communicate. So asking more involves a lot of scaffolding, building them up, having a sympathetic rubric that's realistic for the level. So they don't feel like, wait, the class just got 10 times harder. What just happened? Um, cause I went from like teaching, uh, straight up grammar, the workbook, the whole traditional rigmarole through June, and then showed up in September on fire and did something totally different. And the kids were like, I just remember at the end of the second week, I had the kids journal and one girl was wrote, is it going to be like this all year? Like, what just happened? So I think if they've experienced the other before you've had them, you're going to need to do some education about why, why, what is the point here? Um, but my experience is when you talk to kids and families about, we want you to be able to use the language and know the language, not know about the language that makes sense to them. And the kids have so little vocabulary to talk about language from their English classes that the idea that I would say something to them about present tense, adjectival agreement, demonstrative adjectives, and that they would hear any meaning in that is completely false, at least the way my district teaches. So um, I do think it's possible to get buy-in. It's, I can imagine if everyone else is at the exercise level in your district and you show up with tasks, you kind of look like the crazy person. Um, in that case, you need to get online and find like-minded teachers who are doing what you're doing in other districts. So you feel supported. 
Uh, this next question is from Claudia Fernandez, and she says that I have seen that tasks and projects often get confused, and it also seems that tasks seem to have a stigma in um, in the view of some profession, but projects are more acceptable. So what do you think? Are tasks getting confused with projects? What is there a, an important distinction to be made there? Um, do we have different connotations around those? Yeah. I mean, I have to say, when I hear the word project, I'm still thinking blue, glitter, cutting and or those annoying PowerPoint transitions with the dinging at my my seventh grader loves making those things. So um, a really powerful blog post podcast that I heard on this topic was called um, something like say goodbye to the, oh, is your lesson a Grecian urn? It's from the cult of pedagogy, Jen, Jen, Jennifer Gonzalez. And she was basically describing a situation where the teacher has learning objectives and then they create this project where the children spend a lot of time with glue and glitter, and they don't ever really get to any of the learning objectives because they're spending all their time physically manipulating stuff. Now, obviously, in elementary school, the kids need to develop their fine motor skills, and there are reasons that they glue and cut and, and throw glitter on things. I don't know about the glitter, but everything else. And that's totally legit. But when I read that and when our whole department read it, we all kind of were like, oh boy, oh boy, I need to like, so if I'm doing a project, I actually don't want to spend much class time at all letting them make it pretty. I don't want to have any part of the rubric really that talks about how souped up it is. I'm there for the language. I want to see novice high language in, in this presentation. I mean, it needs to be coherent and comprehensible, of course, but like if you don't have, also if you don't have the money or the parent who's free to like run to stables at 8 p.m. because you just announced you have a poster project to do and you, someone has to go get the poster board, there's like a million projects, project issues. So I think project, I mean, call it a project and it's a task if that's what's going to make your life easier. I don't care. I'm sure no one's in your school probably has read Bill Van Patten or knows anything about this. Call it a project if that makes people happy. But but I think we want to think about the task is purposeful in these very clearly defined ways that we discussed. It may have some project aspects also. Some of the things that I showed you that I called big tasks came from my training in project-based learning. Our district had like a PBL moment before COVID shut that down. And so I did get some training on PBL and I and, and some of those like the wellness one with the screen time and the teens that came straight out of that period of my curriculum development. Um. Let's see, sometimes when doing spontaneous conversations, some students claim that they feel they're being put on the spot, even though they have time to review the material before class. So any strategies to encourage or motivate these types of students who struggle in the language um, and struggle with the sort of affect, I guess, around that spontaneous language production? Absolutely. I think there's two pieces that come to mind right away. One is the rubric you're using needs to be forgiving and appropriate for your targeted proficiency level. So I use this rubric that, that we, is called the talk rubric. It comes from Shrum and Glisson's teacher's handbook. T stands for text type st and staying in the target language. So by text type, I mean, are students communicating in words, sentences, or paragraphs? And before I used this rubric, I didn't realize that I had many students who could not speak in sentences at all because I had never listened for that before. So that's the T. A, accuracy not how many mistakes they made because they're going to make mistakes and you actually want them to make mistakes so they improve, but are they accurate sufficiently for the level? With the material that they've practiced in class, can they be understood, for example, a novice by a super sympathetic interlocutor who's familiar with non-native speakers? Do I understand what you're saying? You're good. Does a French person on the street understand you? No way. Not expected for a novice, right? So target language text type, accuracy. L is for listen. When people ask you questions, do your answers indicate that you understood what they just asked you? And when you ask people questions, are you showing that you've been following the conversation and you're not asking something that's unrelated or that's already been answered or that's off topic, that kind of thing? And then finally, the K, kindness. Not like you're nice and you smile during the conversation, but you do your part to keep the conversation going and you don't take over the conversation. So the way I manage that K part is uh, Kagan has this idea of talking chips and I have a bucket of glass gems. Six of us sit around the table. Every kid takes five gems. Your goal is to get rid of all of your gems. You put one in the basket every time you speak 
And your goal is just as much to help everyone else get rid of their gems. So Catherine's very shy. She hasn't said anything during the conversation. It is my job to ask the next question and direct it to Catherine. Okay. Now, I'm not going to just throw this activity at you out of the blue. We're going to warm up to it by doing ask, ask, switch, where there's lots of teacher written questions that maybe even have sentence starters on the back for suggested answers to begin with. And we're going to do concentric circles with ask, ask, switch, where we practice asking and answering all the different questions. Then we're going to do maybe like a Padlet where we brainstorm other kinds of questions we could ask so that kids could maybe start by just frankly memorizing a couple questions that they plan to ask during the conversation. And then they can also say, if someone were to ask me that question, would I be able to answer it? Okay, then we're gonna do a practice talk where you're in small groups and I assign roles. Person A asks a question, person B answers. Person C makes a comment, person D asks a follow-up question. Once you've completed one loop, everyone changes roles. We talked about talk and we talked about a rubric. Oh, and we talked about the speaking gems. Yeah, I think that's what you need to know more or less. It's a process and you have to build up to it. And as we're coming to the end of our time here, because we are going to end here at 730 and, you know, there were some other questions that unfortunately we couldn't get to live here, but there were a number of questions related to, can you share again, you know, the name of this book, the name of this person you mentioned, I just want to remind everyone, you are going to be getting the recording of this webinar. So you can slow it down at your own speed, stop it, replay it and, and write down all those little um, tips and tricks and references that uh, Rebecca has shared. Rebecca, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, for your expertise expertise um, for sharing so generously of your resources and your teaching practices with us today. And thank you very much to all of the participants of the webinar for joining us. Uh, just a reminder that you can expect um, to later get access to a recording um, as well as the slideshow for this presentation. Uh, we really thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us for future webinars as well.